Romans chapter 8. We're going to pick up today with verse 18, and we're going to finish out the rest of the chapter. And it's a very prominent part within the book of Romans. Some of the most beloved verses within the book of Romans are found in this second half of Romans chapter 8 because they do give us such hope and strength and encouragement for our present day. Um, when we were together two weeks ago, we were talking about how the life in the spirit is so very different from the life that is characterized by the flesh. The fact that Christ has come to live in us, and the proof of that living is the Spirit of God. That's God's gift, God's presence in our lives, reminding us that we belong to God, that we are truly children of God, that we've been adopted into God's family, and because of that, we can confidently call out to God in prayer, refer to God as Father, and know that God truly is concerned about our needs, our challenges, and our hurts. And it's from that that Paul is going to pick up. He kind of sets aside being adopted into the family of God for just a few moments, and he starts to look more specifically at some of the things that we're able to anticipate, some of the things that give us great confidence and assurance because we are a part of the family of God, because we do belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's where we begin today in chapter 8 at verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Paul doesn't deny the tough challenges that go with life. And I know I've said this in various contexts, and I think I've said it previously in our study of Romans. Just because we are in Christ does not make our pain and our problems go away. Some people would make you think, just trust Jesus, just get saved, just follow God, and everything is going to get better. You're going to be blessed abundantly. You're going to have more than you know what to do with. But let's be realistic. Is that really the reality of our world? Trust Jesus and get everything you want? Now, don't get me wrong. We are blessed beyond measure when we have this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But it's a very different kind of blessing. It may not be physical. It may not be tangible in nature. But we are definitely blessed, and we will acknowledge those blessings. For example, when we say, we got up this morning, or we had an encounter with an old friend or a stranger, we were able to catch up, maybe we were able to share Christ with them in that moment. We look at blessings quite different from the rest of the world. And that's what Paul is trying to instill here at this point in Romans chapter 8 that yes, we live in a world that's still characterized by sin and pain and brokenness, but in spite of all of that, we still look toward a new day. We know that this life is not all that there is, and because of that, we're able to face the difficult and dark spaces in life with what Paul would call confidence. 
We live through the trials and the tribulations of life with confidence because we know that what we might be encountering in the present in no way can compare with the glory, that which God has prepared, that which God has for us in the future, but now we have just bits and pieces, little glimpses of what is yet to come. Now that's something that's key for Paul throughout Romans, is what God has already started to do in the present to get us ready for the future. And it's as though some commentators would say, and I think it's a good illustration from everyday life, it's almost like it's a down payment. Now, what God does for us through his salvation is far more than some kind of monetary transaction. It's not like buying a car, buying a house. But still, I like that illustration. We have a down payment. We have the beginnings of this relationship with Jesus Christ, with the Spirit living in us. And that is an assurance that God is going to complete all things. God is going to make everything right in the world one day. One day when Christ returns, one day when we pass from this life into the eternal presence of God, there is that place where there's no pain, no suffering, no worries, no death. And it's that that we look toward. But at least in this life, on this side of heaven, we've been given a little foretaste of it. And that's what carries us along in this journey of life. Now, if we didn't have anything to put hope and trust in, we would definitely be in a pretty pitiful situation. In fact, Paul says elsewhere in his writings that if we hope only for the things of this world and this present day life, then we should be very pitied. But we know there's something beyond what we can imagine, what we can see, what anything this world can offer can even begin to compare to. And that's what Paul starts to focus in on at this particular point in Romans. I consider what I'm dealing with, the struggles, the strife, the pain of this present life are not even comparable to the beauty and the glory of what is yet to come. That's the reason when we have a memorial service or a homegoing celebration for an individual, we talk about what they're seeing and what they're able to know face to face. We anticipate that day, that place, that time when we'll stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in heaven. But we also envy those people who've gone on ahead of us. Because to see and to know what they know in that moment, once they breathe their final breath in this life and they breathe their first life breath in eternity, beyond anything, we think we know beauty. We think we know gorgeous. We think we know joyful. We think we know so many things according to this world's standards. But the best thing that we can come up with and we can think about What God has for us is beyond that. It's beyond hitting a $250 million jackpot. It's better than having our name in lights on Hollywood Boulevard. It's something that this world thinks it knows. Beauty and fame and fortune, but it still pales in comparison to the things that God has yet to come for us. And the way Paul describes this, he doesn't just talk about anticipation for us as human beings. He says some really interesting things in those few verses I read a few moments ago. He talks about how the creation, yes, we as human beings, the crowning achievement we might say of God's created order, the apple of God's eye, we anticipate Christ returning. We anticipate that eternal home that God has prepared for us one day. But here Paul says that the creation is groaning. It's a beautiful and poetic way to describe our world situation. 
And I like the way he describes it here. He says that creation is groaning because it has been subjected to futility. Not by its own will, not by its own doing, but because of our sinful nature. We so often talk about sin and the impact that sin has upon our lives, our relationship to other people, our relationship ultimately with God. But here Paul is saying that our sinful actions have implications on other things within the world whether we think about it or not. Look at how many places in the world where the water is polluted because of human irresponsibility. Look at places where I believe in progress, I believe in building, don't get me wrong, please don't start sending me emails and hate messages. But I think about places that have grown and built up so very much. But what happens when the heavy rains and the storms come? There's places that flood because there's nowhere for the water to go because we're so bent on building more businesses and more houses and more companies and more this, that, and the other. There is no more when all we're doing is adding more wood and concrete and metal around us. Now, I'm not saying that building things is a sin. Don't get me wrong. But what did God say to man in the garden? He says, I want you to have dominion over creation. The idea of dominion means to be responsible, to look out for it, to take care, to be good stewards of what God has gifted us with. But more than being good stewards and responsible human beings with what God has graced us with, we misuse it. And we abuse it. I mean, let's just go ahead and face it. It's pretty easy to hit the electric window button on the car after we finish that Pepsi Cola and out the window that plastic bottle goes. And that's kind of a simple illustration because I think of other places, and it happens right here in our county. It's within just a few miles of the church where we can go down various roads and we see where people have, it's not just a couple of drink cans. I mean, it might be a mattress. It might be a mini refrigerator. I remember this was not long ago in Pikeville. I saw an upright piano sitting in the edge of the ditch, and I'm thinking, that didn't get there by just accidentally sliding off of a pickup truck or a trailer. But yet it was left there. And it stayed there for weeks and weeks and weeks until somebody finally came along and moved it. But that's kind of how we treat the world that God has created. What did God say in the beginning? He created all things, and he said, it is good. This is good. That is good. When he created humanity, he said, it is very good. But think about what we do to mistreat everything that God has given to us. You know, if I'm going to take some leftover motor oil and pour it down the drain... And that's not me, but I know what happens. It's not affecting me. That's why we got drains out there for. We're supposed to, you know, dispose of things and let somebody else handle the problems. And you look at the world today and you see the effects of our waste, our pollution, our destruction of things. I mean, it happens with even the animal creation. How many people will shoot a deer for the sake of the meat and how many just want the horns to be able to put up on the mantelpiece? I'm not harping on hunting and things like that. Don't get me wrong, I'm not on a soapbox this morning. But that's some of what Paul, I believe, is getting at. That creation is suffering because of us as human beings and when we're irresponsible, it doesn't just affect me. It affects other things around me. And that's a part of the fallenness of humanity. 
whether it's air pollution, whether it's water pollution, whether it's destruction of things that we just think, well, all there's all this land out there and we're just going to keep on doing this, this, and this. And it's a part of our sin nature. It's part of our fallenness. Sin isn't just disobeying God and affecting who we are with God, but when we do things and we dominate and we destroy creation, then we're disobeying what God said in the very beginning to have dominion, to look over, to take care of what God has gifted us with. And that's where Paul gets this idea of creation. Creation itself is crying out because things aren't as they should be with the world. We can watch the news, we can pick up the paper, we can open up our cell phones, and we as human beings can tell when things aren't as they should be within society. And in a very poetic kind of way, Paul is saying the same thing. Nature, the trees, the birds, the fish, even they realize that things aren't as they should be in this world as God intended in the very, very beginning. The whole creation is groaning. And you may not think that's a very important part of Scripture, but there's actually a couple of references. One is found in the book of Isaiah, and probably one of the better known references is actually over at the end of Revelation. When we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we talk about a new heaven and a new earth. And what does the one seated upon the throne say? I'm making all things new. I'm making all things new. We live on this earth as if we can just keep going and doing and going about our merry way. Destroy it because, well, it's going to be destroyed one day anyway, so who really cares? But that's not what God has put us into this life for, to abuse everything and to use it up, use it up, use it up. But we do anticipate that day, that time, when God will remake everything. Where there will be no more sin. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no strife. There will be none of those bad things that are so devastating to our lives and to God's creation, even in the present. And at verse 23, Paul speaks of what I said just a moment ago, that we have a foretaste of it. We have a down payment. We have a guarantee. And he uses a couple of things there to describe it. He says that we have the first fruits of the Spirit, and then we also wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, first fruits were really important. They were important, especially when it came to the sacrifices and the celebrations of God's people because the first fruits were the first things that came out of the field, that came off of the tree, that came off of the vine. And it was believed that those first things were also the best things. And so that's why during prescribed sacrifices and times of giving, the people were encouraged to bring their absolute best. Well, when we take first fruits and we apply it to what Paul is saying here, that we have the first fruits of the Spirit, we have a relationship with God through Jesus. His Spirit lives in us. But it's still just the very beginnings of our relationship with God. It's not the fullness of that relationship. It's just like those first few heads of grain, those first few grapes coming out of the field and then being presented to God. It's just a foretaste, just a, a touch of the rest of the harvest. God's Spirit has come to live in us, but we don't know perfection, do we? We're not completely whole in Jesus Christ, are we? God has begun something in us, but as long as we're living and breathing in this life, we're continuing 
to grow toward who God wants us to be. We have the initiation of a relationship with God, but we don't know God in God's fullness yet, do we? And he goes beyond that to say we also await adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now that may sound contrary to what Paul has already said earlier in chapter 8 when he said that we've been adopted and the Spirit bears witness that we're children of God. But is he really contradicting himself? No. When we initiate, when we begin that relationship with God through Jesus, God has begun something new in us. And it's something that's going to continue until we see the glory of the Father one day in heaven when God makes all things new. We still await the redemption of these bodies. Now Paul says just enough over in 1 Corinthians about spiritual bodies, just enough to kind of muddy the waters about what a spiritual body is. But Paul says here that we await that. We wait the time when these bodies will no longer break down. They will no longer feel aches and pains when we try to get up in the morning and get the day started. They'll no longer know fatigue after a hard day of work. We've begun this relationship, but we still deal with the everyday, ordinary pains and problems of life. But God has begun something that will be fulfilled one day, Paul says. The redemption of our bodies. Our bodies will be healed and whole and restored. No more cancer, no more breathing issues, no more heart complications. And that gives us hope, Paul says. We may not know it fully, but Paul, as he closes that section of verses right there with verses 24 and 25, we hope for things that we don't see. Because if something already exists, it's already in my possession, I don't really hope for it. I don't really anticipate it any longer, do I? Because I already have it. But when I really want something and I have yet to receive it, there's that sense of waiting and anticipating and hoping, just like a child looking toward Christmas morning. He or she may see a beautiful package under the Christmas tree with his or her name on it. And he or she may want to open that on the 5th of December, we'll say. but they still have to go another 20 days before they can actually see what's inside that package. But I think all of us can relate to that feeling of anticipating and wanting and longing for what that package is and far more than a Christmas gift on on a Christmas morning, what we anticipate is God. A new creation, a new body, a place where sin no longer destroys people and creation and ruins lives and families and wrecks our relationship with God. We anticipate a gift, but it's a gift that is far greater than any gift of this life. Balter comments at this point. Picking up at verse 26. As if the Spirit living in us isn't a blessing enough because we're adopted into the family of God, Paul goes on to say, Likewise, having the Spirit in us, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. 
But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who were called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. I use that verse so many times, that verse 26, because there are times in life when our prayers are beyond our human words. I think about a biblical example. If you go back to the story of Hannah at the beginning of 1 Samuel, Hannah And Elkanah had a wonderful relationship. Hannah was unable to have children. She was ridiculed by Elkanah's other wife. Elkanah tried to make up for this absence of children. Don't I mean more to you than having ten sons of your own? But on an occasion when they went to offer sacrifices to God, the story tells us that Hannah was praying in the Spirit, and that her lips were moving, but no words were coming out. And what did Eli think? He thought Hannah was drunk out of her mind. What in the world has gotten into this woman? She's over there all emotional, and she's moving her lips, and nothing's coming out, but Think about the brokenness that Hannah was dealing with. To be a woman in that culture at that time without any sons to continue the family name, to have a rival wife in the family who's able to bear children upon children. She was crushed to the core. Her prayers were not because of a drunken state. It was because there were no words to verbalize the pain and the sorrow that she was experiencing on the inside. And that's how life can be for us. I can't tell you how many times people have said, I just don't know what to say to God. I can't even begin to pray in these circumstances. And a lot of times I'll say, just say what you think you can say. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It doesn't have to be polished up. If all it is is God, have mercy on my soul. God knows our hearts. And I love the fact that God's Spirit, even when there are no words, whether it's when a family loses a child or the cancer has returned, or we've done all that we can do in these circumstances and we can't do any more, we're calling in hospice. In that moment, people are numb. They don't know where to turn next, what to do. They have faith in God, but they can't even begin to express themselves. You look at them and say, well, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? And they'll say, I don't know. I don't have a clue where to start. But Paul gives us assurance. Not only does the Spirit enable us to be able to call God Father, the Spirit lives in us and prays with us and on behalf of us when we don't know how to pray. God searches the heart. God knows what's on the inside. That doesn't mean that we simply go throughout our days and say, well, God knows my heart. I don't have to talk to God. God still wants to hear from His children. God still enjoys interacting with us through the gift of prayer. And I love verse 28 because how many times do we use this verse to explain difficult times? That God works in and through all things. He works them together for good. Now that doesn't mean that everything in life is good, is it? 
Not everything is roses. Not everything is fun and pleasant and the way we had planned for life to be. But God has a way of working in and through even the most difficult of times. We may not know it. We may not see God or feel God or understand what or why certain things are happening at a given time in life. But God is still faithful in those moments, accomplishing things for our good. Paul doesn't say anything about God using these things to teach us a lesson or to get even with us or to trick us and play around with us. God can take the tragedies and the difficult moments of life and still accomplish something that brings glory and honor to God. And we may not know it in the moment. It may not be until we look at it years and years removed that we see Clearly, God was active in that situation. I didn't know it. I was oblivious to what all was taking place in that given moment. But God truly did bring something good out of that. It wasn't what I imagined. It wasn't what I wanted at first. But maybe something better came of life because of something. Nobody thought Union Carbide would ever close after all these years, and they did. After 18 years, I was out of work, and you wondered why. But I'd always wanted to be an electrician, so I went back to Pitt Community and took the electrical program, and God blessed me. I passed my electrical exam, and I got a job with Union with Pitt Community College that I thoroughly loved. I didn't even want to take vacation. I enjoyed going to work so good. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that right there is, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Unemployment seems like, oh my goodness, where are we going? What are we going to do next? What's life going to be like? But then, like you said, it gave you the opportunity to go back to school, to become licensed. It changed our family situation because you were working the shift with Union Carbide. Yeah. Never saw you any. Absolutely. So a lot of good things can come out of tragedies. And Ben is like, okay, after he got his degree, he says, Mary Lee, it's time for you to go back mm -hmm. and finish your, your degree. And I did. I would not have. Mm -hmm. God uses some things that we may not like that aren't so favorable. And the reason that we're able to face these things and look back on them and see the times and places where God was at work is because of that relationship with God. I'm already asked him to go back and see my youngest. Hmm. I'm go see my children. I know some of them need hugs. And the way the summer's going, it won't be too long before you're right back, Miss Margie. I hope not. I've asked him to do everything I can go do, volunteer for him. No, we don't need to do that. Mm, 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 mm. Works and we say that. We do use that to describe a lot of things. God works the complete opposite of what the way we work as human beings. We have a plan. We have a design. We have everything sort of worked out and figured out. And God shakes us up because God does things so radically different than what our minds can even begin to comprehend. Mm -hmm. I've heard people describe it as God working behind the scenes, kind of like if you go to a, a play, a production on stage, some of the most important people aren't the actors that are on the stage front and center, but people who are working behind the screen, behind the sound booth, behind the scenes that you can't see who are making that production a success. Yeah. You pull those people out and there is no concert. There is no play. And we know that God is so much more complicated than that, but I think it does give us a helpful image of what God does. God doesn't always have to be, boom, right there in our face to still be working in our lives. 
And that's the key thing. And it goes back to what I read at the close of verse 25 about waiting for things in patience. That's the kicker, is the patience part of it. We're not. And if you pray for patience, you just get opportunities to prove patience. I can't tell you how many church members I've prayed with at the hospital bed. Be with this individual as he or she is recovering. Give them patience with the process. And then they'll look at me like, did you really say the patience were? But that's kind of how we are as humans. We live and I want it now, right here before me. Quick and instant gratification. That's the kind of world we want. So to sometimes wait on God's timing and God's way of working. There's something I told one yesterday. I went to McDonald's for breakfast and this lady was a teacher. And I can't remember what it was she was saying. I said, well, he will do it, but he will do it at his time. Mm-hmm. We have to wait for it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But there's like you're, you know, you've had your hardships. But I think we've had ours, I tell you. <laughs> but it's like I have grown. I really have grown even in those. And I think that's what God wants you to do is to grow mm-hmm. in those times. And, and that's a big difference between facing those times with a relationship with God versus facing and living through those times without the relationship with God. Some people would look at those moments and this is the end of the world, everything's over and done with, just throw up my hands, wave the white flag of surrender. But we as Christians, even though we may not like everything that we have to face in life, we're able to face it because we see things from a different angle, a different perspective. We have a set of, of godly lenses that enable us to face. You know, some people may look at us and how many times have we maybe even thought that? Somebody's dealing with cancer, dealing with unemployment. How in the world do they face it with such grace? Their head is up, they're confident, they're facing the future, they're saying, we're going to fight this, we're going to do this, we're going to... And then it makes us wonder, well, what's missing in my life? how you face, how you deal with, how you cope with, how you respond in those situations becomes a testimony to other people of what God can do in those really low and difficult places in life. And we got to focus on ourselves. We got to focus on us. Mm -hmm. First. We have to focus on our relationship because with God if I don't first. Focus on me and focus on everybody else. Mm-hmm. Then I'm not going to get on your knees Absolutely. I've got to focus on Diane. Mm-hmm. Know yourself, not what somebody else thinks of. That's it. I've got to focus on me. Mm-hmm. Because without Jesus Christ, we are nothing. We are lost. So true. He's so always, very true, Diane. He's always with us. How much he loves you. Yeah. You know, he loves you deeply. He's just like a daddy, like we've said. He's like a daddy and he loves you. And he's not going to reject you. Just always remember. Mm-hmm. He's the father that will be with you forever. Absolutely. Not like a parent that comes and goes. So very true. Supply all your needs. He will supply all our needs. Amen. Yes. Yes. And I'm not taking up the other time, but <laughs> when I was going back to school, I was on unemployment, and I was getting ready to get my very last unemployment check. And we were standing out back between class breaks, and I saw somebody I knew that worked at the school, and I just jokingly asked, I said, what do you have to do to get a job here? And his boss heard me ask him that. And he said, well, you need a job. I said, yeah, I'm going to get my last check. He said, well, I can use you part-time for a little while. 
So I started out part time and wound up getting full time. Just all I had, all I did was just say, "Hey, Robert, what you got to do to get a job out here?" That's it. And Lord opened that door and I, and I got the job. Started out part time, wound up full time. Let's uh, let's finish out. <laughs> Chapter eight, because there's still much more. I'm not trying to cut. We could we could talk about so many, but there's so much that's still in this final section that I think is really important. It gives us a lot of strength and it gives us a lot of encouragement, especially in these times. What are we to say about these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? And it goes back to what you all were saying that you can't worry about what somebody is else says or does or thinks toward you and that's how God treats us scripture says elsewhere he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve to be treated but he treats us with love and mercy and grace he who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us will he not with him also give us everything else who will bring any charge against God's elect or God's people is it is God who justifies, then who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. If anyone has the right to condemn us, if anybody has the right to judge us, it should be the Son of God, but here Paul describes the Son of God as sitting at the right hand of the Father. And this brings to mind something that the author of Hebrews speaks of when he talks about Christ being our high priest, our go-between in our relationship to God. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's kind of a litany of all the terrible, tragic things about life. Anything you can imagine, anything you can come up with, Paul says, that you think might distance your relationship with God, there's no chance. Whether it's in this life or in passing, if you have that relationship with God through Jesus... Maybe you're experiencing persecution. A lot of times in funerals, we'll read these latter verses, but we do skip over verse 36 that talks about being handed over as sheep to be slaughtered and being killed because it does kind of put a little bit of an uncomfortable spin on things. But all of these things are not ideal circumstances, and these are all things that we may deal with, that we may feel at some point in our journey of life. But Paul says none of these things can ever separate us through our relationship with God. When we have Christ, when we have the Spirit telling us that we are children of God, when we've got that Spirit praying for us, when we've got Jesus interceding at the right hand of the Father, when we've got that kind of relationship, nothing. It's like the psalmist says, where can I go? If I go down to the deepest sea, you're going to be there. If I go to the highest mountain, you're going to be there. God's exactly where we are. He's right there in the trenches. He's right there in the pit. He's right there in our depression and our darkness. He's right there in our joys and jubilations and celebrations of life. Wherever we are is where God wants to be and God truly is. Thoughts or comments as we kind of wrap up this section and wrap up this chapter this morning. I like that part about the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. Mm -hmm. so sometimes you just don't know what to pray. I mean, when somebody is like, at least nephews laying there paralyzed because can't even speak 
or do anything from the mouth down. I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, how do you pray? Yeah. I mean, you want to pray that he'll make full recovery, but the chances are don't look that good. And I mean, he's just he going to lay there the rest of his life, not able to yeah. do anything. You know, I mean, how do you pray? And even when we don't want to pray, and I'm sure there's a lot of anger there. I know, how do you get past the anger stage? You know, it's like, why? They're very promising. Very oh, yeah. Promising. He already had his doctorate. And very very good at what he did and meteorology and right. research and. granddaddy was a preacher and I know he Brad is. Mm -hmm. I know he is. Hmm. You don't you don't understand. But I know God's there and he will never reject us. He'll always love us. Even in our tough times. I know he's there. Yeah. And we could certainly add more and more things to that litany. Can paralysis can Confinement to a bed. Can any of that separate us from God? Not when we're in Christ. Thank y'all for being here this morning. It's good to have y'all back together. Good to have you all watching via, via the web stream. And we ask God's blessings to be upon you all as well. Let's bow as we close in prayer. And we prepare to go forth and serve. Heavenly Father, we are so truly thankful for the gift of this day, the time that we've been able to share together in your holy word. Lord, I ask that you would be with all of my brothers and sisters wherever they are today or in the days to come, wherever they may find themselves serving in your name. I pray that you would use them, that you would strengthen them and use them to be instruments of your love and goodness and peace wherever they find themselves. Lord, we know we live in some trying and troubling times, but we have that great assurance that you are always for us and with us and in us, no matter what we experience on this side of heaven. Lord, I ask a special blessing upon all of those who are here in person, those who will come tonight, those who will watch this service in the coming days. Lead, guide, and direct us according to your will and your purposes, and may we live lives that bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.